Welcome back to We Want Picks. I'm Artem MMA, and I'm going to be breaking down and predicting every single fight on the week number six card of the Contender Series 2024 season. So far, so good. The fights have been great. My predictions have been a lot better than they were last year. And I am coming off a week five card where there was only four fights, and I did get two fights correct. But my two confident predictions were correct. And then, unfortunately, Ota Tanzalov did lose a pretty close decision. But it is what it is. Coming into this card here, I I think that this card is going to be fun because I think there's going to be a lot of knockouts. I think there actually is potential for someone to win by knockout in every single one of these fights, which is why I think it's going to be so good. However, I think that this is actually a card that is very difficult to predict for quite a number of reasons, which I will, of course, talk about in the video later. I have had an article up for this card for quite a while on the We Want Picks website so for that you actually get articles that i write talking about uh the contender series bellator other promotions as well on the we want picks.com website for ten dollars per month as well as angelo and jacob's bets as well you can get a three-day free trial if you do sign up using my code artem so with all of that being said i'll get into my predictions so the first fight of the card is going to be between two middleweights in Euro Naito and Atiba Gautier. Euro Naito is actually currently the king of Pancrase, so he's the champion of Pancrase. And he is, of course, from Japan, and he is a wrestler. He has a high school wrestling background, and in fact, has actually competed in wrestling at a very high level, because as a junior, he even competed at the Junior Wrestling World Championships. You can see that in his fights, he doesn't really strike too much. He likes to go out there, dives for takedowns from literally anywhere, and tries to finish off his opponents pretty quickly. And typically, he has been able to do that so far. A lot of his wins have come in the first round, and they have come very quickly, but they have all actually come from him going out there and using his wrestling and winning the fights in that way. On the feet, he's got decent boxing, but I don't think that striking is really his strong point. The strong point really is the wrestling. When he gets on top, he's dangerous. He can submit, and he can also land a lot of ground and pound. He takes on Atiba Gautier, who I think that does have a pretty good chance of maybe pulling off the upset here as he is the underdog. Atiba Gautier is definitely more of a striker. He's a pretty big guy for the weight class, and I think that he is going to be a lot bigger than Euronato. But Atiba Gautier, I think, does have a couple of things that he does struggle with and has showcased some struggles in his career with these two things. And that is cardio, I think is the main one. But aside from that, it's takedown defense. Now, to be fair, we've only actually seen him leave the first round on tape once. And that was against Glenn Williams. In the second round, he gassed out. In the third round, he had absolutely nothing left. And the reason why he gassed out was because Glenn Williams was wrestling. Glenn Williams was making him work. Atiba Gautier had to be constantly defending the takedowns. And eventually, he just genuinely gassed out. Now, aside from that, he's just kind of been beating up his opponents. You can find his wins pretty easily on YouTube and UFC Fight Pass. He's just been knocking out everybody on the feet aside from Glenn Williams. So it kind of just comes down to that, you know, it's a wrestler versus striker matchup. Euronito's the wrestler. Ateba Gautier's the striker. I am going to side with the wrestler in this matchup here. I know for a fact that Euronito is going to be attempting takedowns. Now, this can be somewhat of a bad thing because he does just attempt takedowns from anywhere like he can be halfway across the octagon and he's diving for the legs so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out but i do think ultimately euronito is going to make a typical ta work in that first round and i think that the gas tank of a typical ta is really going to be sucked out of him and i think that euronito is going to be able to start taking over in round two and maybe round three if it gets there but i'm gonna pick euronito to win by finish by ground and pound in round number two over a gassed out Atiba Gautier. So that is my pick to start off that card. And now we move on to an interesting one. We have two heavyweights, Talison Teixeira fighting against Arthur Lopez. The most interesting part about Arthur Lopez's career is that he has actually only fought one time in the last six years. And that fight was not at heavyweight. In fact, it wasn't even at light heavyweight. It was at welterweight. So Arthur Lopez is a former welterweight and he was a welterweight as early as 2018 and has now just become a heavyweight now that period of time that he has been a heavyweight has only lasted 20 seconds and you can actually find this this fight on youtube it's on a youtube shorts video you'll know you've seen it because this result will happen and i've commented on it but 
what happens in this fight is this guy Daniel Pashir, who genuinely looks like he's never trained before, just walks forward and Arthur Lopez just just lands a massive hook on him and just puts Daniel Pashir down and then the rest of the 22nd period is just spent of him just very much late finishing Daniel Bashir, who just taking so much damage. So, yeah, that, that's it. That's all we have on him at heavyweights. All I know about him is that he's got big power. Aside from that, he's fought at welterweights, and those fights were in 2018 and earlier. Now, the interesting part about Arthur Lopez is his nickname has actually changed. It actually was John Jones, and I think that might be a way that they potentially found him was through his nickname. I'm, I'm not even joking, because, like, there's not really an easy way to find a heavyweight prospect that has fought once in six years. But we can move on to his opponent, Talison Teixeira. I personally am very high on Talison Teixeira. Yes, he does have a lot of flaws, but at the same time, you're looking at a six foot eight heavyweight that has an 81 inch reach and the best part about it is he knows how to use that reach. How often do we see guys that are super tall for the weight class and have really long reaches or just are kind of physically gifted but don't necessarily use it properly? I think Talison Teixeira is that kind of guy. He is a very tall guy in general. He's a tall guy for the weight class of course and he just strikes from range very very well. He does have one punch power. He doesn't necessarily have the best level of competition so far and he has looked like he can be pressured a little bit by previous opponents but I was impressed by what I saw I did like what I saw in his LFA fights now I do worry somewhat that he just still hasn't quite fought that guy that's going to give him that UFC level experience and I don't know if that's going to be Arthur Lopez because he's fought 20 seconds as a heavyweight in his career and once in the last six years but I am going to pick Talison Teixeira here he is my most confident pick on the card I think he looks good. I think he looks promising, a 24-year-old heavyweight. I think if he gets a first-round knockout, Dana White's going to be all over this guy. And he's a massive favorite. Tell us him to share it is minus 550 right now. And it was somewhat expected for that to be the case. And I am going to be picking Tellison to share it to win by knockout in round number one. Now, Benjamin Bennett fights against Joey Hart. A battle of two guys that have a 6-1 record at 170 pounds, and a battle of two guys that both actually have very experienced amateurs careers. Now I would say that Benjamin Bennett probably had the the better amateur career. I mean he did become a, a world champion in the amateurs and I M A M A F world champion in 2017, went 18 and 4 as an amateur. But Joey Hart definitely had a good amateur career in his own right as well. Went 8 and 3 as an amateur. That's a lot of experience to have before you become a professional. Now Benjamin Bennett, the way that Benjamin Bennett fights is that he is a wrestler. Now he does box quite a lot and I don't really like the amount of time that he does spend on the feet but if you do watch him he does look very big to be a six foot tall welterweight his boxing's decent but I wouldn't say it's his best skill set I think his best skill set is 100% that wrestling now the thing about Benjamin Bennett that I think that could be maybe raised as a little bit of a red flag in a matchup like this is that he doesn't really get every single takedown that he attempts now of course that's not really not normal I mean you're never going to get 100% of the takedowns that you shoot for but Benjamin Bennett does require quite a few takedown attempts to get the fight down to the ground but once that fight is down to the ground Benjamin Bennett can take over he's got nasty ground and pound he's got very nice grappling as well on the ground which is quite impressive to see and he can move from position to position the struggle even though he does have great wrestling genuinely can just be getting that fight to the ground in the first place he takes on Joey Hart, who I think if he wins and ends up in the UFC, he is going to be a lot of fun. I kind of like this guy. He's got a YouTube channel, which is pretty cool. He's even starred on like other people's YouTube channels. I believe there's him showcasing his grappling in like a video that's called something like Is BJJ Fake in MMA or something like that. And in that fight, Joey Hart just showcased how good his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is in that video, I should say. But to talk about his fighting style, he is like an Alex Caceres, Peyton Talbot sort of guy at 170 pounds. This guy has some of the better movement on the feet that I have genuinely seen at this weight class. This guy is really good at moving around. He's got very, very fast kicks, got very, very fast hands. He can find wins in all sorts of ways. I believe his most last two recent fights have actually come to knockout wins in the clinch so he has been in the clinch against his opponent and he's landed nice knees on the inside that win over tyler scott was 
brutal. <laughs> it was a brutal knockout win, but that's just what he does, man. He genuinely does have very good movement, very good striking, slick striking as well on the feet for a guy at this weight class, and I'm very impressed by that. Now, I do think that he also has a weakness, though, and it's a weakness that Benjamin Bennett could potentially exploit, because his takedown defense is what has kind of struggled for him the most so far. Now, to be fair, he hasn't really needed to worry about it too much in his professional career, aside from one fight in this fight here against Diyu Karayev. It was a very difficult fight, fight to find. In fact, actually somebody else sent it to me, so I want to give him the credit. Patrick Denar, who is a European reporter, sent me this fight. It was very difficult to find on YouTube, so shout out to him. Only had 160 views. But in that fight, he um, fought against uh, Dia Karayev, and Dia Karayev is apparently a Sambo world champion, at least that's what the broadcast was saying, and Dia Karayev just took him down at will for all 15 minutes of the fight, and Joey Hart was getting up, but he was getting taken down over and over and over again. Now, that fight took place in June of last year, and he's won four times since then, so of course he could have improved that takedown defense. And if you wanted to go all the way back into his amateur career, I did actually watch quite a few of his amateur fights. And it kind of was the same sort of story. He was getting taken down pretty easily, but he can actually throw up submissions off of his back quite successfully. And in fact, he did win multiple of these fights as an amateur by submission. So maybe you see quite a bit of BJJ from Joey Hart if he does get put on bottom position, which I am expecting to happen in this fight. I do think that Benjamin Bennett on the feet is going to be at a pretty big disadvantage. He's taking on a guy that has much better movement than him, is a lot faster than him, is taller than him with, with more range, and he does like to box quite a bit. Now, Benjamin Bennett actually has fought a somewhat similar stylistic matchup where he took on Trey Waters, who is now in the UFC and is 2-0, where Trey Waters is a very tall, rangy welterweight striker, and he did get knocked out in that fight, but he got knocked out in the third round after winning that fight, using his wrestling, of course, and control. Since then, he fought the same guy twice. I couldn't find the most recent version of the fight, um, or not version of the fight, the most recent fight, but he won them both by KO in the first round, and I'm pretty sure they must have just been in this exact same way, where he does find success on the feet, but he ends up hurting Michael Graff, just takes him down and ground and pounds him out. And then after that, he does take on Luis Inuguez, which is his most recent performance, and honestly was not the most convincing performance I've ever seen, but he did use his wrestling to win that fight. I think that Benjamin Bennett's team has to be looking at this matchup and thinking that Benjamin Bennett needs to wrestle because if he strikes, I think he's going to be in a lot of trouble. And I think that's why he is the underdog. But I am going to pick the wrestler again in the wrestler versus striker matchup. I do believe that if Benjamin Bennett goes out there with a good game plan and shoots for takedowns, he can find the upset as the underdog. Benjamin Bennett right now, plus 100. When the odds opened for this fight, it was minus 115 either way, and money actually come in on Joey Hart, making him the favorite, but now it looks like money has come in on Benjamin Bennett, so maybe the line flips by the time that the fight does end up rolling around. Now, Aaron Toe fights against Elijah Smith. Um, you guys are going to hate me for this one. A lot of my subscribers are from New Zealand, and of course, a lot of my subscribers are big fans of Aaron Toe, and although I'm, of course, from New Zealand and I do support New Zealand fighters as much as I can, I I can't let my biases get in the way of predicting a fight. And I will be honest with you guys, I do think that Elijah Smith does win this matchup. He is my pick. There's a lot of people that aren't going to be happy with that, but that that is my pick. That's kind of what I've come to in this one here. Watching tape on Aaron Toe, there is absolutely no doubt um, who his influence is, and that is Dan Hooker. If you guys don't know, Aaron Toe won the Dan Hooker Scholarship, where I believe he was actually living and working in Australia at the time. He won the Dan Hooker Scholarship and then moved over to New Zealand to then train at Dan Hooker's gym. So not to see kickboxing, but Dan Hooker's gym. I kind of forgot the name of it. I think it's called like fight factory or something like that in Auckland but I believe more recently he has now actually started training at city kickboxing and spending a little bit more time over there but Aaron Toe he does fight like Dan Hooker he's a striker and what he does is he fights with his hands pretty high up and in front of him just like Dan Hooker does and he pressures forward and that's the best part about his game then is the pressure forward but I do worry about some moments where 
he will love to brawl. Like, he'll be fighting guys that he clearly is a better striker than, and he'll be welcoming a brawl. He'll be letting them hit him so he can land big counters, and he can land his big power. And even at some times, he can get caught by lesser strikers. You know, I thought he got caught quite badly by Paul Oger in round number one, although the fight ended in the round, in the first round with Aaron Toe knocking him out. Paul Oger was landing some big shots on him before that fight ended up finishing. And then Shane Parker was finding success on the feet in his own right, and Toe really started to mix in his wrestling and also his striking to eventually get the win in that one there the thing that Aaron Toe does the best in my opinion is his is just his power he's not a big uh, bantamweight at all and he has looked quite small at bantamweight especially against Paul Loga but when he lets his hands go he has a lot of power he's got very nasty knees in the clinch as well which is how he's finished a lot of his opponents but I do just worry at moments though because he's doing all of this pressuring but he doesn't throw enough volume. And I think that a guy like Elijah Smith, who is a tall striker, I believe Elijah Smith is 5'9", which is pretty tall for the weight class. He has good reach. I think he's going to be the much bigger guy in this matchup against Aaron Toe. And I think that Elijah Smith just kind of is a somewhat bad matchup for Aaron Toe, unless Aaron Toe wants to mix in the wrestling with the striking as well. I think in a pure striking matchup, Elijah Smith could find some success against Toe. I think that Toe can get hit a little bit too easily. The way that Elijah Smith fights is that he is a sniper. He's 5'9", he's going to be taller in the fight, and he throws a lot of straight shots, throws a lot of leg kicks as well, and he does have, have found a lot of success so far in his career doing that. If you guys didn't know, he's actually the son of Gilbert Smith, who I believe only fought for the UFC once, but... It was on the Ultimate Fighter finale, and Gilbert Smith was actually on the Ultimate Fighter for two seasons. <laughs> so Gilbert Smith, Ultimate Fighter legend, but never really got a UFC contract. So far as well, we've seen Smith beat, in my opinion, better opponents than Toe. Toe being in New Zealand, there of course is going to be a lot of limited opponent options for him there, but he hasn't really beaten the same kind of level of competition that we have seen Smith go out there against. Yes, Smith losing to Reyes Cortez is like somewhat of a red flag because it was by KO in the third round. In fact, I actually watched this live. This was actually the card which Chayares versus Vasquez ended in like the worst way possible. But um, yeah, Reyes Cortez, he was able to find some success defending takedowns and found success on the feet. But then Cortez took over and finished him in the third round. After that, though, he's gone on to beat a couple of good guys. Josh Walker. Pretty brutal KO. I thought it looked like an elbow when it when it landed, but it turns out it was like a right hand in, in, in the middle. And then he did beat Robert Trujillo, who was a prospect at some point, until Elijah Smith beat him. I am going to pick Smith here. I'm going to pick Smith to win by decision, or maybe even by knockout as well. I think that Aaron Toe has a very good chance of knocking out Elijah Smith. I think this is a much better fight for him than the Kwang Lei matchup was. But I think that Smith is going to be too big at 135 pounds. I... I think that Aaron Toe can find a lot of success if he lands with the power, but I have seen him in the past not throw enough volume, and I think that Elijah Smith can kind of capitalize on that. So I am going to pick Smith, and I believe that Smith is the favorite. Now, Elijah Smith actually opened as a pretty big underdog. I believe Aaron Toe actually opened like minus 260 or something like that when DraftKings first dropped the odds, and then the odds flipped when I believe Bet Online dropped the odds and then they flipped again. They've just kind of been very volatile going back and forth, but it seems like it's settled now at minus 175, Elijah Smith, even though he did open up as the underdog. He is my pick. I am going to pick Elijah Smith. Of course, I'd like Aaron Toe to win, but uh, just unfortunately, I'm going to pick Smith. That's it. <laughs> Let's move on. Dylan Mantano, Dylan Mantello fighting against Ahmad Suhail Hassanzada. This is my final pick of the card and my final underdog pick of the card because I am going to pick Dylan Mantello to win this matchup here. Dylan Mantello is actually sitting, I believe, right now at plus 145 and Ahmad Suhail Hassanzada is minus 175. This is an interesting one because both of these guys have been on the contender series before and in my opinion... It's, I don't understand why they're bringing them back. Now, Dylan Mantello lost his fight against Kanan Krachuski, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and Ahmad Sahel Hassanzada lost his fight to Nazim Sadikov. But then, since losing to Nazim Sadikov, he's only won two fights in a row, and he lost uh, a fight as well after that to Josh Streaker. 
Amatsu Hail Hassan Zada, I would say that he is mostly a grappler. I think a lot of people would consider him to be a striker, but he definitely does attempt a lot of takedowns, and the best part of his game probably actually is his jiu-jitsu. Against Nazim Sadikov, uh, to be honest with you, he just kind of got beaten up the whole time. Yes, he did attempt a lot of takedowns, but Sadikov was finding a lot, a lot of success on the feet and eventually knocked him out with, honestly, a pretty brutal knockout win in the third round. And then we see Ahmad Sahel Hassanzada go out there again six months later against Josh Streaker. He gets dropped. He gets dropped badly by Josh Streaker in the first round. And then eventually does end up losing a decision because Josh Streaker was just able to kind of use that momentum. And then after that, he goes out there against Aliko Sagliani. And once again, the first round, he gets dropped, and he gets dropped badly. In fact, the referee, I think a lot of referees actually would have potentially stopped the fight year against Sagliani, but it actually didn't end up happening. And Sagliani actually went on to, I believe, find the success in the second round as well, and Hassan Zada really had to find a bit of a comeback. Against Jason Blair, though, I think that out of all of his fights, this is actually the best performance that he has had so far. Jason Blair actually takes him down, and then Ahmad Sahel Hassanzada, honestly out of absolutely nowhere, just finds a knee bar position and he gets the knee bar and taps him out quickly. That was a very, very impressive display of his jujitsu, in my opinion. He fights against Dylan Mantello, who is definitely more of a striker. Now, he does attempt to take downs every now and then, but that's not really his game. He is a striker, in my opinion, anyway. Dylan Mantello, though, he has have quite a few of his own flaws, and actually the fight on the contender series against Kanan Kutruski did showcase that. Kanan Kutruski in that fight was a lot faster than Dylan Mantello and was able to land with power on Dylan Mantello and eventually just kind of quickly took a very bad position that Mantello was put in and choked him out with like a power Brian naked choke. And Dylan Mantello then lost that fight. But of course, after that, he got one win against Nate Williams. And unfortunately, Nate Williams isn't really the best opponent. If you do watch that fight, Nate Williams does genuinely find some success on the feet. Which is kind of crazy to think about because Dylan Mantello looks so much bigger than Nate Williams in that matchup. He had a big size advantage. Dylan Mantello, though, although he is a very, very technical striker... He is very slow. I don't think that he has the greatest reactions for a striker. His striking speed in general is also pretty slow, even though it's super powerful, and he can get caught in moments, which is why Kanan Kruchewski was beating him to the punch when that fight was on the feet, and even then, Nate Williams was, was actually finding success and being a little bit faster than him on the feet. The reason why I'm siding with Mantello, though, is because I think that Ahmad Sahel Hassanzada is the kind of guy which we have seen on the contender series to go out there and look for a brawl and i think that if these guys brawl it out i think the guy that's going to end up on top of a brawl is dylan mantello we've seen ama tahayo hasanzada knocked it down multiple times now by smaller strikers than dylan mantello less powerful strikers than dylan mantello and in my opinion lesser fighters than dylan mantello as well i do think that mantello is a little bit slow for the weight class at 155 but I think he can make up for that, especially in a matchup like this, with his technique and also with his power. So I am going to pick Dylan Mantello to go out there, low confidence pick of course, and knock out Ahmad Zahail Hassanzada. I do just kind of want to end off the video by saying that a lot of these picks are very low confidence. I only have one high confidence pick on the entire card, and that is the heavyweight fight. So definitely just kind of be careful with this card. I think even this might be one just to play very lightly and 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 honestly if you're not feeling a hundred percent just 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 kind of leave it because this is a tough card man i think that there's a lot better cards coming up and i think that week number seven is looking to be one of them so let me know of course what you think on the comments below i think this is a pretty fun card i'm expecting a lot of knockouts so i'm excited for the knockouts if they come and um yeah i think that there should be a couple of decent prospects to come out of this one personally do have a couple of fighters that i'm very excited to see in the ufc if they can win so yeah let me know what you think and i'll see you guys in the next one